give a quick overview of, of Tellurium specifically, and then talk about some of the key applications, the end uses of this material. Why are we so excited about the fact that there might be Tellurium here uh, in this region? I'll also talk about how Tellurium is currently produced and some of the production levels, and then get into what the future demand is uh, for this material. I'll then build a little bit on uh, what Frank uh, started to talk about in terms of how we might develop mineral deposits once we've identified that they exist, and then tie that into specific potential opportunities for Josephine County and Southern Oregon as a, as a whole, and then we'll finish with, with some final thoughts. Uh, that's a bit of an eye test for you. Uh, basically, a lot of the information in this presentation, and I always put this slide up, uh, is third party information, so we think it's reliable, but we just want to point that out. So, stand in disclaimer. Okay, so Tellurium, or Tellurium, depending on how you pronounce it. What is this? It's uh, a chemical element. You may remember uh, your periodic table from high school days or college. And Tellurium basically sits all the way on the right over here, um, just below selenium. And Tellurium is a, what we call a metalloid, which is an unusual group of, of elements that are a combination or have properties that are combinations of metals and non-metals. Okay, and if I should just go back one slide, all of these elements in this sort of area here sort of have unusual properties. These are all metals <coughs> on the right, sorry, on the left of the periodic table, and these are non-metals. And so the elements that straddle that region have properties of, of, of both. <coughs> Tellurium is a semiconductor, uh, like silicon and germanium and some of the other elements, which makes it very useful for electronic applications. Uh, we've all probably got electronic devices and cell phones and whatnot, but those that all contain semiconductors and semiconducting materials. And there are some other useful applications for Tellurium in that respect. Tellurium is actually rather rare, it's actually very rare on planet Earth. Um, the average distribution across the whole of the Earth's uh, crust is, a, is roughly one part in a billion. Okay? And to put that into context, that's about a third of the, uh, of the concentration of gold, which is also pretty rare, right? Uh, ironically, in the whole of the rest of the universe, it's quite abundant, uh, but for various reasons, the Tellurium disappeared off, off Earth millions of years ago. Uh, not by aliens or anything, it's just uh, uh, natural processes. Um, but we've known about Tellurium uh, since the late 18th century. Um, it was discovered in uh, 1782. Once discovered, probably probably forgotten because we didn't really know what to do with it, like many of the elements that were discovered back then. Uh, I deal a lot with the rare earth elements, similar time, there were chemists and scientists starting to understand uh, a lot more about uh, matter and compounds and chemistry and so on. And so they would find these elements and say, well, that's kind of interesting, don't know what to do with it, let's move on to the next thing. So Tellurium is probably, probably in the same boat now. Today, Tellurium is, is primarily used uh, in a relatively few number of applications. Um, it's added to steel and other so-called base metals. About that in a moment uh, to improve the machinability, our ability to turn it into useful products. So, there is also used in radiation detectors. Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. And probably of, of most interest going forward is the use of this element in what we call photovoltaic cells, PV cells, or solar panels. Okay, and there are a few other uses as well, including uh, chemicals and, and catalysts. But those are the, those are the primary, primary applications. So we can add Tellurium, or TE uh, for short, to steel. Um, you can add as little as 40 parts per million uh, to 400, about 0.04% uh, Tellurium. Uh, has a dramatic effect on our ability to actually machine and turn and drill uh, these, these materials. And basically, this happens because the tellurium when you add it reacts with other stuff that's in the steel, which can make machining difficult. And so you're, you're uh, 
helping to, to eliminate those. <coughs> this element's also added to a lot of copper alloys, um, free, what we call free machining copper. Uh, you know about half a percent to that. And basically that's important because when you're doing machining, particularly at the industrial scale, um, with copper, and if, you, if you've ever done any metal working, you'll see these sort of strands of copper come spiraling off as you're, as you're cutting, um, cutting the material here. Um, adding to lower turns that into little pieces. It's a lot easier then to dispose of that and to speed up the process. It makes it a lot cheaper and uh, keeps the, the industrial guys happy. And we apply it to cast iron and a lot of other metals and alloys as well for, for similar reasons. Really important application, as I mentioned earlier, is for radiation detectors. And in this case, we're going to add tellurium to two other elements, cadmium and zinc, to form a compound, a special compound, that is pretty unique and that it can be used in devices to detect radiation at room temperature. So we can use it without having to have special cooling and things like that. It also has this material uh, about the highest spectroscopic resolution of any material. What we mean by that is we can look at a whole range of electromagnetic radiation and kind of pinpoint what that radiation is, what the quantity is, and so on. And what that means is we can build high performance, very sensitive devices and appliances to detect radiation. And what do we mean by that? Um, there are a number of applications for this. Uh, the most obvious would be things like security scanners at the airport, um, medical imaging, if you have an MRI or other uh, imaging uh, procedures done, the, uh, uh, these devices are detecting the beam that's, that's going through. Simple industrial process control, uh, many food uh, plants and, and industrial factories use electromagnetic radiation to detect minute changes in perhaps the thickness of a piece of steel or the amount of food that's in a container. And uh, again, kind of mundane applications, but they affect us every day. We don't, we don't really realize it. Homeland Security, I've already mentioned, um, but that's quite a serious application. Probably every port, probably every airport in the USA has these devices discreetly placed to pick up any unusual signatures, any unusual radiation readings trying to make sure that someone isn't bringing in some radioactive material, or worse. Uh, and of course, these devices are used at nuclear power plants uh, and power stations as well, so that we know what's going on with, with radiation, because we can't see radiation. Um, but really, the largest area of, of growth and interest is in these PV cells or the, the solar panels. And you may be familiar with the, the concept, but essentially, we design these systems so that we take the energy that's present in sunlight and convert that into electricity using these special materials. And the process occurs at the atomic level, uh, it's what we call solid state. And uh, we can use a variety of materials for, for doing this. Um, most recently, the interest has been creating very thin films of some rather exotic materials, uh, one of which is based on a, a compound of cadmium and and the current world record for uh, efficiency of conversion is around 20%. And what we mean by that is of all of the energy that we can theoretically get out of uh, the sunlight shining on a particular solar panel or piece of material, we're getting about 20% of the energy out. So you can see there's quite a, uh, a long way to go in terms of being able to get more energy out as we get better at making these materials understanding how they work, uh, but that's pretty good for, uh, for this type of application. Tellurium-based PV cells do compete very well with the more well-established silicon-based uh, PV panels. Silicon as well is a semiconductor. Um, the the tellurium-based panels have a number of advantages. Basically, you, you're putting out less CO2. Uh, it's quicker to get payback on the energy used to make the panels. Uh, and lower water usage. One key concern which we'll talk about uh, in, in a little bit is do we have enough tellurium to make these solar panels? There's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. These make great, uh, great applications for tellurium if, if we can get it. 
So how much delirium do we actually need? Well, the typical solar panel made from these materials generates around 100 watts of, of power per meter squared. Okay, 100 watts is uh, context maybe a, a rather bright light bulb uh, uses about 100 watts, and so a meter squared, just a little bit larger than a yard squared, um, will generate 100 watts. In that solar panel, we're using about nine grams of, of tellurium, 9.3 grams. So if we wanted to to generate uh, a gigawatt of power using these solar panels, we would need 93 tons of tellurium. One gigawatt is about the output of, a, of an average coal-powered, sorry, coal-fired power station or a nuclear power station. And if you do the math, I, I looked online, the, the typical energy usage of, a, of an average Oregon home, uh, one gigawatt of power would be enough to power three quarters of a million uh, Oregon houses, average Oregon houses. Okay, just to give you some, some context there. Uh, this is a, a busy slide, but basically um, a solar panel consists of two big thick pieces of glass and some very thin pieces of very exotic uh, metals and materials in between. And sandwiched in here is the cadmium tellurium uh, compound with some others there to help conduct the electricity once it's been generated. <laughs> What's interesting about tellurium is that um, there's not a lot of reliable information about current production levels, which might sound surprising. Um, the US Geological Survey, which um, does a lot of, of work on this type of, type of thing, estimates only worldwide, worldwide, only about 100 tons a year is, is produced in tolerance. Okay, Compare that to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of tons of copper and steel and, and aluminum and so on. So it's, uh, it, it truly is a rare metal. Um, some of that is, is produced in the USA, uh, 40 or 50 tons. I had to go with the British Geological Survey to get that information. Um, uh, and then Japan and Canada and Peru uh, seem to be the sources of the rest. I've seen other sources, particularly the Department of Energy, that says that production may be closer to 500 to 700 tons a year, but either way, it's not very much, right? It's, it's not very much at all. Again, when we think about how much tellurium we need to, to generate a gigawatt of power. So where does it come from at present? It's actually a byproduct, primarily, of copper production. Uh, the tellurium is, is found in very small quantities in copper ores and copper minerals. And so, as part of the process of making copper for all of the various applications out there, uh, typically using the electrolytic refining process, using a lot of electricity and power to, uh, to get the copper out of the solution. The, the tellurium that's present, along with one or two other elements like selenium, drop to the bottom of these containers, and uh, they're known as anode slimes. Okay, it's a great terminology here. Um, and about one part in a thousand uh, in the concentrators is, is the tellurium. So what we do, is these slimes are recovered once the copper process has been finished and they're roasted, they're heated with uh, sodium carbonate uh, and then we leach the material and then reduce it from a, an oxide to a, a metal and we have tellurium. Okay. <coughs> Typically sells for around $100 a kilogram, it's about $45 a pound um, for reasonably pure or four nines or 99.99% tellurium. And that's the, to, today that's the major way of, of producing um, this material. But there's a problem. There's a change happening in the industry with respect to how copper is produced. Okay? We're shifting from the old electrolytic refining to what we call solid extraction or electrowinning. And that's a result of the change in the way that these copper deposits are being mined, or just the deposits themselves. And as you get lower and lower grades or concentrations, it becomes more and more difficult to use the established ways of processing them. So the process engineers, um, you know, rightly so, have said, okay, we need to be able to get as much copper as, as we can out of these materials. Let's use a different process. 
as a result of that, we don't uh, take the tellurium with us as we get to that final stage that's left behind. So tellurium will not be available as a means of, uh, uh, via this route, as a means of, of extraction. Okay. And for the copper guys, it's just not worth, they're making the money on the copper, not on the tellurium, right? So copper is what they're after, and they don't really care about, about the tellurium. I mean, they care, but not, not, not enough. So that means there's going to be pressure on the supply of tellurium. Okay. There's only one known, to my knowledge, one known what we call primary deposit of tellurium in the world where the main mineral that you're going after or the main um, reason that you mine is for the tellurium. And that's an a, a unusual deposit in the Sichuan province of China. Um, if you do the, the analysis, it's about 0.8 to 2% tellurium. In the, in, the, uh, in the ground in this region, it's a very unusual deposit. Uh, it's primarily this tetradimite mineral, which actually has been mentioned a couple of times already, uh, which is a bismuth based mineral. But what's happening now is much greater interest falling back on uh, gold tellurium or telluride minerals as a source for, for tellurium for these applications. <coughs> And there are a number of ways in which these minerals form. Um, uh, Calibrites, uh, cranorites, silvernite, just some of, the, some of the examples of these minerals. But basically, a chemical bond is formed with gold, which is quite unusual, as you may know. Gold doesn't really form compounds very readily with, with many, um, many elements, but tellurium is one of them. Again, around the world, there's only a handful of projects currently underway as this, this problem is, is being acknowledged for tellurium access. There's a couple in, in Mexico. Um, the project that I mentioned in China and both of the uh, first two projects in, in Mexico are being driven by solar panel companies. Okay? So they're not really in the mining business. They don't really want to be in the mining business. So if this is the only way they can get tellurium, then they've got to do what they've got to do, right? Um, there's also relatively little work being done on optimizing how you process these minerals, but basically you dissolve them once you've concentrated them, the tellurides, you dissolve them in, in concentrated acid. And what's interesting is that the tellurium is dissolved, it goes into the solution, and you leave gold behind. So it's actually a great way of processing the, the gold that's, that's present. Um, the solution turns a, a quite a distinctive red purple color. Uh, and then we can use fairly standard ways of getting that tellurium out of the solution once it's been put into solution. Uh, but this is also a useful way of detecting the presence of tellurium by you know, putting a little piece of the mineral in this acid, heat it up, it turns that color, then uh, you know you've got tellurium. But you also know that you've got, you've probably got gold as well in the gold uh, tellurite form. So this, the gold that's in these minerals isn't the shiny free gold that you'll see in that To my knowledge, there are no significant, if any, gold tellurium projects underway in terms of, of development in the USA. Uh, but there is definitely a significant opportunity uh, for the right project to, to be developed. So, some examples here of the, uh, the minerals, basically shiny and attractive. Uh, this is uh, calibrite, uh, uh, clenorite. Silvernite. Uh, this one sometimes you'll get silver that shows up with the, with the gold as well. So just some just some examples of the, the minerals. So as we've talked about, the key uh, reason we're interested in tellurium is because of solar energy. Okay, and regardless of how you might feel about solar energy or renewable energy, solar panels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the reality is that since 2012, the overall capacity of production of energy through solar panels has basically been increasing by 50% on average every year, uh, year in, year out. Okay? People are making solar panels. Um, 2012, the total capacity of solar energy worldwide was around 102 gigawatts. That is estimated to rise to about 690 gigawatts, almost sevenfold increase. Most of that's going to come from uh, what we call utility scale or utility 
operated facilities where you'll have these, these big solar farms, so to speak, probably in deserts and remote places. But placing these panels on buildings or on street lamps, uh, which we frequently see in the West, the Western states, uh, will continue to be a, an important uh, location for them. And what's interesting is that the cost of generating electricity is well on its way to competing with normal power generation, particularly for retail electricity. So you know, one of the criticisms of the solar industry and, and renewable energy in general, the subsidies that are associated with this, well, from a technology point of view, we're getting to the point where these technologies are competitive, will be competitive, which is, which is great. Um, all of that, of course, hinges on our ability to keep improving the efficiencies, being able to uh, make these panels for, for lower and lower costs, um, and doing so you know, effectively. One point I will make is that just because we've got uh, you know, a gigawatt of solar panels doesn't mean that it's constantly generating power. I probably don't need to point out that solar panels don't work at night. Right? Uh, so, and sometimes if it's cloudy or really you know, dark and dingy in the sky, you don't get as much sunlight. So the average utilization is probably closer to 20 to 30 percent. Um, so the more efficient we can make these, the more energy we're going to get. PV cells based on the tellurium compound um, right now, and probably for the next few years, make up about 5% of the market, depending on, on who you talk to. As I said, there are a number of different ways of making these panels. Uh, so if we assume conservatively that the market into the future will be about 5% of all solar panels, would be made from materials that contain tellurium. Uh, we need around 2,700 tons of tellurium between now and 2035, which is an average of around 115 tons uh, per year. Okay? And bear in mind that according to the USGS, we're only making 100, 110 tons a year worldwide currently. Uh, some with, with, with a glass half empty would say there's no way we're going to be able to do that look at it from the last half full point of view is as a major opportunity to supply the solar industry if you have access to tellurium. And of course, if we can make these materials even more efficient uh, in terms of their ability to generate electricity, or if we can find new sources of tellurium, that market share, that percentage may increase, and so we may need uh, even more uh, tellurium. One other comment I'll make. We heard earlier a little bit about the, the uh, defense stockpile, I think, with respect to, to chromite. Um, every year, there's one bill that always passes in Congress. Okay? It's about the only bill that always passes every year, and that's the National Defense Authorization Act. Okay? It basically is the main way that we fund the Department of Defense in the USA. Part of the DOD mandate is, is, is part of the Defense Logistics Agency, one of the many agencies that make the DOD. Part of the mandate is to stop our materials that uh, are important to the whole supply chain related to the Department of Defense. And I have to say, in, in recent years, it's been neglected. Uh, there's been a lot of materials sold off, uh, just like the chromite for uh, the President Nixon. Uh, but uh, last year, the bill, I think, passed right at the end of last year. There was language put into the NDAA that basically instructed the manager of the defense stockpile to secure um, a set of materials that were deemed uh, important to the defense, industrial, and essential civilian needs of the USA. Okay. And there were six materials on that list, and one of them, one of them, was that cadmium zinc tellurium substrate that's using those radiation detectors that I mentioned. Okay. So that material has been so important to national security, to, 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 to the defense of, of the realm, so to speak, uh, that the stockpile guys have been told, you better buy some of this and have it available in case we need it. Okay. Now, there's not going to be a whole lot of uh, tellurium sold into that application compared to, say, solar panels. Obviously, but it just gives you an idea of the importance of even small amounts of materials uh, to uh, critical applications. And so tellurium is one of those uh, one of those materials. 
So we know now that there's a, a spotlight on Tellurium, there's a big interest in Tellurium. Um, how, do we, how do we get from A to B? How do we, if we uh, know that this is of interest, how do we develop these projects? As, as Frank mentioned earlier, mineral development is all about getting uh, data and information, and more data means reducing project risk. And when we talk about project risk because ultimately someone has to invest in, in any mining project. Uh, for both the exploration, the early stage work, as well as the actual mining. And any investor, whether it's a private investor or uh, you know, a government entity or whatever, you have to understand the risks that are involved. Okay? And so this whole exploration and mine development process, there are a number of stages that we go through. Uh, I'll, I'll walk, walk you through these, uh, these briefly. Uh, but it does all start off with uh, you know, folks out in the field actually looking at rocks and, and figuring out what may or may not be there, doing initial exploration, then getting into some real systematic heavy duty exploration, quantifying what's there, turning those into what we call feasibility studies, figuring out the economics, the logistics, how will we get it from A to B, how are we going to actually do the, the engineering, and then actually building a mine and putting it into operation. So prospect generation is really all about, as, as, it, as it sounds, generating prospects and identifying targets that we'll then do a lot more detailed work on uh, down the road. And so it typically involves looking at a, an area or a region, uh, looking at some historical sampling work, uh, it's focused on the geology and the geochemistry side of things. Um, and these are typically undertaken, these types of, of endeavors taken, undertaken by what the industry calls prospect generators. And actually the American uh, mineral research is a good example of that type of company. Um, extensive local knowledge um, of the various occurrences and, and deposits and formations in an area. Uh, that local knowledge is so vital for understanding um, and understanding this. And typically these companies are in possession of a lot of uh, hard won and, and hard earned uh, data and, uh, and maps and surveys of particular uh, deposits. These prospect generators, in general, um, particularly with the more obscure metals and minerals, will partner with what we call the, the junior exploration companies, basically with the small um, uh, companies that, of which there are many in the US and Canada, Australia and elsewhere, uh, who basically are the money guys. They're going to find the money, try and bring the project along, invest in, and increase the value. Or alternatively, with given the right backing and the right um, circumstances, a prospect generator could themselves become a, a junior exploration company. No reason why not. So we've got some basic data. We know we've got some interesting places to look. What do we do next? Um, basically, we now need to do some detailed evaluation. And again, this is typically done by a junior exploration company because it, it does involve some somebody uh, to do this. They'll be drilling, trenching, basically uh, taking the material out of the ground, custodying, which is uh, another, another form of trenching. And the idea is to do the work required to come up with an idea of where does this deposit start and stop. Uh, we saw the picture in Frank's presentation of that. And that's done basically by it's experimental work. It's empirical. You drill a hole, you take a sample out, you send it to a lab, you test what you've got there, and basically develop this like a 3D picture of what's in the ground as well as the minerals themselves, what different minerals do we have, uh, the minerals that we want, the minerals that we don't want. At this point, very important for any company doing this to, to get involved in, in, in engaging with the local community. Uh, in this case, you know, the work that we may be talking about um, is, is very near. I've worked with companies that are building projects or looking to build projects. The nearest person is 120 miles away up in northern, northern Canada. But somebody somewhere uh, may have a, a rights to use a piece of property or hunting and things like that, so you have to be very careful. Um, we take a very systematic approach with this, and basically we're looking to define the, the resource uh, in the ground. Um, maybe use some pro preliminary economic assessments. So we're not just looking at the geology, but we're also thinking now about the value, the costs, um, you know, what's, what's the money side of it. 
um, as well as some more advanced work called preliminary feasibility studies. Once we've done all of that, basically we're trying to get to a point where we say yes or no. Are we going to proceed with this project? Is it economic? Um, and that's all based on the results of what we call feasibility studies, where we're increasing our knowledge level, we're putting more holes in the ground to figure out. Uh, we know we've got good stuff here, we've got good stuff there, is there good stuff in between? And again, more data points equals more confidence. You also have to have a process developed to, once you've got the stuff out of the ground, then what you're going to do with it, right? So you've got to have an idea of uh, crushing and grinding and, and some of the chemistry and the chemical process that is required. Uh, you have to design the mine itself, okay? It may be narrow vein mining, which is, uh, which is a sort of a surgical approach very attractive, uh, particularly with high-grade deposits, or you may, you know, you may need a more extensive underground mine or, or an open mine. Uh, at this stage, environmental impact is, is very much uh, part of the whole process. Modern mine development, modern exploration um, has the environmental impact and uh, the mitigation of that very much uh, front and center. Okay? Uh, and that, of course, also involves significant community engagement. Uh, it's very difficult to get permits in any of the Western countries uh, without having the community engagement. Um, all of this costs money, but it's, it's, it's what's done these days. And at the end of the day, you have what we call a definitive feasibility study. These guys can go to a bank and hopefully uh, borrow some money if they need to, or raise the capital to then build the mine and do the project. Um, and in, and in this case, we're going to convert the mineral resources into mineral reserves. And the mineral reserve is basically um, the definition of the economics, the viability of the project. And of course, permitting will be, will be well underway. So when we're looking at availability of minerals, we're looking at four dimensions. Okay? We always think about the geology or the rocks, the stuff in the ground, that's the kind of obvious, uh, obvious dimension. Uh, but there's a technical dimension, how Specifically, are we going to process this material? There's the sort of intangible, the social, environmental, political, legal, but the people side of it. Uh, and then the economic. Can we uh, economically mine this if the first three uh, dimensions are in place? And so this mineral resources and reserve state, it's all about classifying a particular mineral deposit in each of those four dimensions in a systematic way that stands up to scrutiny. Um, mineral resources we know are in the ground, they exist, and to some extent we know that they um, may be economic, we may have a process, that type of thing. And mineral reserves, much higher degree of confidence. Um, we know that it's going to be feasible to develop in all, uh, all dimensions, uh, and it's typically a portion of an overall defined uh, mineral resource. Um, I'll just breeze through this touches again a little bit on what Frank talked about, but there is a system called NI43101 in Canada which was put into place to prevent uh, future scandals. There was a assaulting scandal uh, where a company called Reex was putting blocks of gold in uh, drill results, pretending that it came from out of the ground. Uh, uh, long story, it was probably not a good idea. Uh, so they put these rules that basically said, you've got to do this, this, and this when you're reviewing or, or analyzing the project, um, when you're putting out information, you've got to have an independent, qualified person, and you can't just use an in-house person to, to do this type of work, so that there's um, objective, independent work done. And so a lot of these projects, because of, of the quality, and I, I like the approach that's used, um, it's pre preferred by, by investors in, in, in North America. I won't, uh, I won't get into too much detail here, Frank had mentioned these different levels of resources, inferred, indicated, measured, it's basically increasing the amount of information that we have by doing more drilling, by doing more testing, and so on and so forth. It's always better to have more data, but of course, more drilling, more testing costs more money, and so you have to balance you know, the, the cost of doing that with the benefit that you're going to get. And I'm happy to share a copy of this presentation with anyone, uh, anyone that wants one. So finally on this uh, reserves, we have probable and proven. Basically, it's taking the portions of the, of the, re 
new sources of income established and then applying the economics. Can we make money by mining each of these portions of the, of the, uh, of the resource? So how does that all factor into Josephine County and Southern Oregon? Um, as we heard today, this region has Tellerites. Uh, really no doubt about that. Um, that's, been, that's been a long term. So we know that there are minerals in the ground around here uh, that are a combination of gold and tellurium. Clearly, uh, from a money point of view, the primary interest or primary development will be based on the, on the gold, going after the gold, because there is also, of course, free gold present, native gold. There, also, there is also native tellurium, the mystery, mystery white metal. Uh, but the, for the reason I've already said, the fact that there's also tellurium here would make the projects, potential projects, more attractive. At the end of the day, it is all about economics. Again, as, as Frank said, can you produce at a lower cost than the market um, in which you can sell? I mean, you've got to make some 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 money doing this, right? Having a high grade deposit is, is one of the keys to that, and uh, that basically means that you're not having to move quite as much material to get the same amount of stuff, right? Which is which is a cost factor. As we said, the area is highly prospective, as we say, for these, these minerals. In the gold world, anything over one part per million, one gram per ton, um, is, is usually given very serious consideration for development. Um, I've seen data in this area for 30 parts per million. That's about an ounce, uh, an ounce per ton and higher. Okay. Now, the scientist simply says that's great, but we need more data, right? That's that's really important that we don't get carried away with this. But I've again seen enough evidence that uh, there that could be materials with even higher concentrations in that, and really high grades of tellurium, 210 parts per million versus one part per billion in the typical five years across, across real concentrations of tellurium. So that's, that's really quite exciting. So there are junior companies, junior mining companies out there that would have an interest um, if they knew this idea, if, if, uh, if they were aware. They would probably follow that previous model that I mentioned of, of working with a prospect generator, um, partnering with the local community, doing some drilling, figuring this stuff out, um, doing the testing and assaying. If there was a local lab to do that, so much the better. Fantastic. One of the issues <laughs> that we're finding in North America right now, believe it or not, is if you're doing mineral testing for these types of projects, uh, it's taking weeks and months to get the results back from the lab. There's only so many labs, and they're just inundated. So if you can set up a lab, and it's not that expensive, uh, then you can really speed up the time that it takes to, to do the work. There's always an appetite for potential high-grade gold projects. It doesn't matter uh, where, where in the world that is, what time in history. If you've got high grade gold, um, there's always someone who's going to be interested in that. But the tellurium that's present here may be enough to attract not just the, the money guys, right? It may be enough to attract what we call the strategic partners, the people who actually use the tellurium, right? The, the solar panel manufacturers. We already know, as I said, that there are at least two or three deposits being developed right now by companies that are making these solar panels. They want to secure their supply of tellurium. They know that relying on that old current and old process of getting it from copper uh, production um, is a threat to their supply. And if they're building their business model on these, uh, these thin film cadmium tellurium uh, methods, then they've got to have a secure supply. And of course, tellurium forms part of at least one compound on that defense stock. So this was, was a strategic interest there as well. So if we could establish mineral reserves in, in this region, um, you know, you basically would, would be able to, to have um, mining and, and processing here. Um, associated with that always are, are good, high quality, high paying jobs. Uh, increased demand for the, the residential and industrial real estate. And of course, uh, the topic of this conversation is the ability to generate taxes and, and revenues from royalties uh, as a result of those activities, getting uh, the value and benefits of the local community 
that this material is in the local community and should benefit the local community. You may also see other companies come in, maybe a solar panel manufacturer, maybe other, other companies who are attracted to the, uh, the activity that's going on here. And um, as we also saw, there are plenty of other types of minerals and metals that occur in this region. And what you tend to find, and we've seen it in Canada and Australia and elsewhere, is once you start to get um, companies coming in and developing projects, uh, partnering with the local community, other people see that, and you get a snowball effect, a positive snowball effect, you get other people coming in maybe looking for copper or lead or zinc, whatever it might be. Um, so that's, that's a, another good thing. Really important that I emphasize this. We're not talking about the, the mining of yesteryear by that. I'm not referring to the, the, uh, the guys going in small mining here. What I'm talking about is, is the, um, you know, the, the strip mining that you may have seen of uh, coal in, in Virginia or places like that. That's not what we're talking about with this type of mining. Um, the, the engineering companies that are used, used today to do this kind of work, environmental considerations are, are always uh, front and center, as is a solid, comprehensive end of mine life Plan. What are you going to do once you finish mining? If this mine lasts 10 years, what are you going to do with that mine? It's a very important part of it. Uh, the modern mining and modern development is it's, it's integral and it's part of the permitting process and it should be part of the permitting process. You know? it's, uh, it's important that, that the land uh, be of value afterwards. So part of that is attracting the right partners into the, into the area, but I really do think you know, I'm a technical guy, I'm not a political guy or a finance guy, right? Uh, so I'm talking really from the, from the technical uh, side of things, but I, I really think it could be a, a great thing, a win-win for this, this county and, and for the region. So some final thoughts I'll leave you with. Uh, the irony here, of course, is that uh, there's quite often a lot of opposition to mining from folks who are worried about the environment. Um, so the irony, the irony is that uh, you know, right here, in this area are the very materials that can be used to make the green energy, the sustainable energy power, solar panels, that our environmentalist friends would like to see. Um, Tellurium will be a large part, an important part of the ongoing development of, of, of green energy through solar panels, and this region really could, could play its part. Uh, we need to get the story out and, and attract uh, the right attention. It's important that the community be involved. It's fantastic that you're here and, and you're, uh, uh, that you're showing an interest in this. It's important that you kind of learn and understand what's what's going on. Um, and I think that this is a really good start to you know, a process that could be a real value to, to folks in this area. So I just want to make one acknowledgement to a professor of the Colorado School of Mines. Um, uh, some good discussions on some of the information in here. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Okay, let me begin with the first here, and that is, how do you get by the fact that the BLM slash Forest Service has not approved a plan of operation to mine in almost 20 years? We'd like to take that. <laughs> anyone? 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 Actually, I, I, I could talk to that a little bit. Mr. Mike? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the problem that we've had in the local area with the federal government and the federal agencies has been that, um, and Southern Oregon Resource Alliance has asked for this, for the County Board of Commissioners to actually use uh, what is legally uh, entitled coordination. And uh, the Jackson County Commissioners and the Josephine County Commissioners both have said that they would use coordination with the federal government. That's the way that you move this process along, is that you actually have your local people sitting at the table with the government officials making those decisions on what's going to happen and how you're going to ramp that up in your communities. I know our sheriff has been working diligently because of the road closure area with the Forest Service and the BLM, and he's caught a lot of heat over that, over uh, opening up some roadways and stuff for public safety. And I believe that the same thing uh, is affecting us as far as the, the mineral industry is that the, the BLM, I've talked to a couple of their uh, staff people, 
I think they would love to see, you know, the industry start to percolate a little bit more, but it, what happens is that they're uh, controlled by what's happening in Washington, D.C. So we need to use coordination. We need to uh, have our state legislators that are representing us in Washington, D.C. I'm talking about Senator Wyden, Senator Merkley, uh, Greg Wallen, all of those people participating. And it's too bad that each one of them didn't have a representative here today to hear what this uh, summit was all about. You know, I'll answer briefly too. We did invite those uh, those federal representatives, by the way. They're all very busy, I'm sure. But uh, I, I want one thing I wanted to throw out is is developing a, a small scale mineral property on private land is, um, is is much easier than on federal land, and, and on county owned land, it's also going to be much theoretically much easier than on than on federal land. But for very small scale operations, small scale meaning. The, the federal government, Dogami, uh, the state, so our state agencies and the federal agencies allow you to, during the development stage of an operation, pull out a significant amount of mineral material without any sort of significant permitting required. There, even in the development stage of a property, you can, you, quite frankly, you can make a lot of money and benefit the local economy significantly without, in, even before you get to the permitting stage. And uh, in some properties, the very small, mom, we call them mom and pop opportunities that we have in our county, the very small, very rich opportunities we have in our county, um, you, can, you can basically pull out about 5,000 yards of material, which is a little bit more than 5,000 tons of material. And when you have um, some material that has up to an ounce per ton of, of gold in it, for example, you're talking about a property that can pull out um, the equivalent of, of six to eight million dollars worth of gold in a year, that's even before you get to the permitting stage. And so there, there's a real opportunity to, to develop some of these properties and to, and to impact the local economy, um, even without the, the burden of a significant um, of federal infrastructure that would get in the way of, of, a, of a larger scale project. So there, there are some great things that can happen even on federal land that we have in our community it's, it's actually easier to develop a mineral property than it is to develop a timber property. And, and that's because we've got these pockets of really high-grade, uh, economically viable material that, that are relatively minimal uh, surface disruption. And, and you can, with the proper mining claims, you can, you can do a whole lot of work um, without even the federal government getting in the way. And there's some laws that come from the late 1800s that are still in place today that allow a small-scale responsible project to get done relatively easily in a matter of months uh, without, without too much red tape. Okay, we've partially answered this question already, but I do want to do the uh, question or justice here. And the question is, will this be open to the mom-and-pop miners or just mining companies? Is it open to the small guy?
then you show a pattern of success that can be shown to the, you know, you, you establish a precedence of success. You can build on this success and you can put political pressure even on the federal government if you demonstrate that you can have success at the private level. So um, I, I guess I would say that you know, plans of operations do exist on, in federal waterways. There are you know, federal and state jurisdictions involved. There are different programs there that, that are competing. It's a difficult environment to work in uh, in terms of a mom and pop and whatnot, but there are partnering opportunities that make things possible. So yes, it's, it's very difficult, but it's doable. All right, thank you. Next question for Dr. Hatch. If Tellurian is in 5% of PA, what's the other 95% made of? And I would have a follow-up question. If Tellurian is 5% of... It says PA. I wonder if we mean AU. Um, okay, so if you... The, the numbers that I mentioned, the, the parts per million, are basically the, the rock that comes out of the ground. So the mineral, so the, the question then is what is, what are the other minerals present besides the, the, the telluride? No? Did you ask the question? Well, let me uh, hit you with the uh, follow-up here. You cited a PV efficiency of 20.4%. Was that made of tellurium? Yes, 20.4% efficiency for a tellurium-based solar panel. Yeah. But to answer the, the, the earlier question, I mean, there's, there's plenty of other minerals that contain things that we're not interested in. Could be uh, silicates, it could be sulfides, or whatever. So um, there's, a, there's a wide range of normally occurring elements besides the, the particular minerals that, that we're interested in. And that's the majority of, of what makes up the rocks uh, around here. All right, next question. Even though mining could help this community economically, no doubt the conservation and environmental groups will try to disrupt any efforts that would benefit this area. Are we prepared for these confrontations? I'd like to address that. I, I think that um, there's a lot of people that are interested in green energy. And I think if Tellurium is a green energy vehicle that could help the economy in this area, that Perhaps this would be a great opportunity to have the environmental community come together with the uh, mineral industry aggregate and and try and, and do something. I've never seen a spotted owl living underneath the rock, to be honest with you. Uh, but there may be an endangered nematode. So you know, but but or salamander. But I, I do have to say that I, I really do think that timing is right for this in Josephine County. It's a great job creator. You're talking about. Uh, high wage, high paying jobs uh, working in this industry. And I think that um, there are so many rippling effects that people don't realize as far as equipment and tires and, and different types of mechanical things that go along with the mineral industry. And if you had these people with these higher paying jobs, let's just say we created 50 new jobs and that created a million dollars a month in, in income, that income goes seven times usually back around throughout your community. And that's what we need. We need job creation. We need money flowing back to our local community so that we help all of our small businesses in our community and help our communities grow. Okay, Jay, you wanted to add something? Yeah, we, you know, we kind of figured there would be some environmental considerations just because these types of operations um, don't happen, haven't happened much in the past 50 years, and so we don't, we don't as a community really understand what they look like. Um, the, the, the reason that the committee, the SOS committee that put this on is called the Hard Rock Mining Committee is, is what we're focused on recommending in terms of, the, of mining is hard rock mining. Hard rock mining, um, a, a lot of the environmental concerns stem from the impact on waterways in our county and in our communities. Um, a lot of hard rock mines happened up on the top of a mountain where um, there are no waterways even anywhere close to these operations. And so um, hard rock mining means, means small scale narrow vein mining where you go in and you pull out 
high grade material that are very that has very very valuable minerals in the ore. And so a lot of all mining is not created equal. We're we're not necessarily uh, there are different considerations for different types of mining. So the placer operations and dredge mining and other types of mining are, are can be and are very different than hard rock mining. And so the uh, we actually uh, visited a couple of these um, uh, potential sites yesterday. We took Gareth, our keynote speaker, on a tour yesterday so he can get a better sense of what we have in our area. We visited a couple of, of, of sites that are potential mineral properties. They're up on the top of a mountain. They don't, uh, very little water in and around them. There are no waterways in and around them. Um, and that, that's one of the big, thing, big environmental concerns is how does this impact our waterways? And a lot of these operations can be done without any impact to, oper to our waterways. And, and it's important to keep in mind that, uh, that uh, all types of mining are not created equal and there are some small scale or maybe even larger scale operations that that are uh, very environmentally responsible and uh, and one, re one of the reasons we invited Gareth here by the way is um, he's going to help we hope help put Southern Oregon on the map in terms of the, the, the resource wealth that we have here this is an economic development related uh, related event and, and Gareth is at the time that he was here and, and the opportunities that he saw uh, he is going to release some information to his, uh, his list of subscribers in this industry and, uh, and um, he, he, so he's gathering as much information as he can while he's here and he visited a couple properties yesterday. We were up on top of a couple of mountains yesterday and to show him the types of opportunities we have and, uh, and, and he's, he's going to help put Southern Oregon on the map in terms of bringing investment into Southern Oregon and, and hopefully, um, hopefully impact our, our local Economy. Next question, and Jim, I think you partially answered this, but let me run this by the panel again quickly. Uh, our questioner says, I still don't understand how does the county gain funding from allowing mining and or timber harvesting? Did you want me to answer that? I think I can do that. Well, I think you partially yeah. did, but I, I just want to let you embellish that if you'd like to uh, directly address our questioner. Well, the methodology would be by royalties. Um, I think that you could do it either by leasing to a company uh, for a certain amount of money that a uh, certain percentage of the values would come back to the county. Um, but there's numerous um, business opportunities, I think, with the county to either work in coordination with them, because maybe even the county would like to get involved in the mining business, you know what I mean? I've, I've often thought about that, that, you know, if we've got a we've got a timber resource department, why couldn't we have a mineral resource department that also had employees that uh, were extracting some of these uh, rare earth metals? So, I mean, that's the potential. But basically, first you have to do the prospecting and make sure that you've done the correct exploration and make sure that you even have a value there. Okay, next question here. Uh, would old copper mine tailings be likely to contain profitable amounts of tellurium? Um, that's a great question. It would definitely be worth looking at, uh, at copper tailings, also tailings of any um, historical mining, uh, particularly gold. But uh, yeah, copper, uh, given the, the percentages that you frequently find, uh, you would expect to see at least some subtellurium. How much obviously depends on, on the specific occurrence, but it would be worth taking a look. All right, very good. I'm going to combine two questions here. First one says, I'm very pleased to be here today. I live in Jacksonville. I'd like to know who in the room lives outside Josephine County. Would you please have those from Jackson County stand up as well as each of our other counties? I would love to see some engagement with Jackson County. And then another question, although I realize the primary focus today is on Josephine County, does any of the panel of experts have any insight regarding the magnitude of similar history and opportunities in Jackson County. First of all, uh, raise the hands of anybody who is from Jackson County today. Okay, wow, good turnout, thank you. Uh, Douglas County? All right. And Curry? All right. Any other counties here in the southwest? Goose. Goose. Goose? Okay, yeah, very good, thank you. Okay, then uh, let's see, let me uh, sharpen a pencil here, and that is uh, any of the panel of experts have any insight regarding the magnitude of similar history and opportunities in Jackson County? Okay, 
Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, it's uh, been a long time in the making to get this going. But to answer your question, Jackson County, Josephine is in the center of what we believe is, is a mineral belt, a north-south north -south structure. And it's referred to, I refer to it as, as the Tri-County Mineral Belt. And Jackson County is very famous. We all know it started uh, in, in the Medford area, originally in, in Jacksonville. And uh, the actual city is built on top of old mining tunnels. But there was a very famous uh, gold mine called the Op Mine, uh, similar to the Bitten Mine in, in H period, etc. And that mine is, is, is basically a job creation type of a mining project uh, where they could go into narrow vein mining there also. It has been dormant for years, but through my research, uh, the op mine also has what's referred to as pesticide, which is a gold telluride we didn't cover today. Uh, so we do know that, I know, my company knows, we, we have tellurium there at that location at this time. Um, I've done a lot of sampling over the years. I'm going on 25 years of this. I have a library of unpublished articles that no one probably in this room could find. And it takes thousands of hours to do that. And it doesn't pay very well when you're not getting paid. So. <laughs> So, so in that being said, I was able to track some of these people here that's kind of been watching me over the years. I don't have credentials, but what, I, what I've done is I vicariously looked through these credential people. And I want to uh, make one more comment. In, in 1999, I brought a company here called Magna Kim Exploration, and I was introduced uh, to them by Frank, Frank Ladke. When Frank and I was looking under the microscope over in Merlin at these rocks that had gold tellurides and tellurium in it, and he says, if anybody can figure out what you got, is this guy. And so in 1999, I paid the service here, and, and I, we're still uh, a client of his. And uh, Magna Kim, uh, we, we published some unpublished reports within ourselves that uh, shows quite a bit of opportunity, uh, which is referred to as the Grants Pass Mining District. You ever thought about that? Grants Pass had a mining district. A lot of the discussions, is, everyone thinks, is out in the, the other districts throughout Jackson, Josephine, and Douglas counties. But, um, so there's, there's quite a bit of history, and as you see, the, the resistance even for a governor trying to get things going, it's pretty hard. So. Hopefully this will be the start on it, and I hope that it answered your question about Jackson County, because they're just as rich as Josephine County, almost. <laughs> Michael, thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to give you right now the quote of the day. It doesn't pay very well when you're not getting paid. Like that. <laughs> That's a beautiful quote. All right, uh, do you have any specific mineral projects targeted for study, exploration, and mining? And if so, are any of these projects in the latter stage in which we can see production or revenue in the near future? Well, one of the, one of the reasons we're, we're here talking about this today is the wealth of opportunities that are out there. If there were only a few opportunities, we probably would have taken those in the private sector and would, would see if they could develop those. But there are so many opportunities out there that we wanted to at least start the discussion on a public level today in, in earnest and to talk about them. Uh, as far as the SOS Hard Rock Mining Committee is concerned, the recommendations we have already made to Josephine County are that they look at, uh, at historic mine properties that, that were developed old school style, you could say, uh, many, many years ago that are already on county owned land. Uh, the county needs to start look at and consider what it already owns. And there are some historic mines on county owned land that. Uh, that we hope the county starts looking at a lot more closely now in terms of some pilot scale development projects that help tell us what we have and could more importantly provide some direct revenue to Justin County and I suspect the same thing it, it is present in, uh, in Jackson County and Douglas County and Curry County and maybe even to some extent in, uh, in Coos County. Um, uh, what, what we as, a, as the SOS Hard Rock Mine Committee had already recommended is that the county first look at 
historic properties that have produced at one point in the past that are already on county owned land. And uh, that's, that's going to provide the best bang for the buck, at least in the near term. Now, this is, this is a process that takes, takes years. It takes years to develop your natural resources. So this is not going to be a, a big revenue source for the county tomorrow. But what we're interested is in a series of long-term sustainable solutions that can help benefit our, our communities in Southern Oregon. And so first step is uh, to look at a few mines that we've already identified that are on county owned land. And, uh, there are literally hundreds of properties that are, that are on or near county owned land. But, so there's no need to single out any one of them, but there's lots of prospects. Thank you. You know, didn't, uh, we didn't get to the situation overnight, and so a lot of these solutions, most of the good solutions are going to be long range, I'm quite sure, but it's got to start somewhere, and it's got to start sometime. So, All right, question directed to Jay and uh, Michael today. First of all, a political question. Encouraged by the ballot initiative idea, why not simply make it a county initiative so enough of the required signatures can be collected in this well-informed county. And after that, I'll have a governmental question. Like I said, that uh, a signature effort related to mining and uh, like a royalty structure, I assume that's what the question means. It's not, uh, it's, it's not really necessary to, to go to that route. Um, we, we thought it was important to survey the county and what the county thinks of all the different potential solutions we have in front of us. But, uh, um, it you know it might come to a point where where the county could could where we could look at an initiative that would require some sort of royalty structure to the county, um, but uh, you know privately owned land is one thing, county publicly owned land is quite another, and so I suspect that uh, whatever sort of initiative we might consider doing in the future uh, looks a lot more closely at publicly owned land rather than privately owned land. We don't want to put any restrictions on on, on privately owned land, so. Uh, that you know, there, there's not a necessity to um, uh, to see what the we already know what the public thinks about this. Uh, generally speaking, now the one thing the commissioners might consider, they have a question. The, the county's got a question on the ballot right now that talks about you know should we harvest some of the burned timber that we experienced in the, the major fires in the last year. Um, that you know that sort of question I think is where we would start rather than an initiative process that would force certain actions. Uh, maybe maybe some sort of simple question we could put on the ballot saying, you know, here here's generally what the opportunity we have and what do you think about the county taking advantage of that opportunity. Another question here, what would it take to attract federal support or repel federal restrictions that obstruct prosperity? So what would it take to attract federal support or repel federal restrictions that obstruct prosperity? I could answer part of that. I, I would say to have a different Congress that can work together and get some decisions done. You know, because really, Congress doesn't care about Southern Oregon. I know that's tough to believe, uh, but they, they, they don't really care. And, and not only do they not care, our senators, our, our um, uh, Senator Wyden you mentioned, and, and Senator Merkley, and State Representative DeFazio has all put a, uh, they, they would like to see the, the 1872 mining law uh, revolt or redone, and the reason that that's not being done is because of uh, of Colorado and East and that delegation there. And I'd also say that since they haven't done that, they've they they put in uh, some some acts, some writers, to, so that there wouldn't be any gold mining on the Chetco and, and the Kalamazoo and that stuff. And so they're really not for economic development. So your suggested fix could happen sooner rather than later. Okay. Thank God. Yes. How can I add to that? Um, so one thing I've, I've uh, I guess, discovered in the last few years is that um, there's, there's, a, there's a contradiction here. It feels sometimes that there's nothing we can do about anything at the local level in DC. Um, but what I've discovered in, in, in this respect, um, and, and not to do with Oregon specifically, but um, if you talk to the right people in, uh, in DC um, and understand the horse trading that goes on with, uh, with these various senators, uh, Wyden, uh, Senator Wyden uh, was until recently um, head of the Natural Resources uh, uh, Committee is no longer 
uh, involved in that, and so there's, there's, a, there's a, ch a challenge there. Uh, but Senator Murkowski, Lisa Murkowski of, of Alaska, who's a ranking member of that uh, committee, has a bill uh, that is being considered right now called the Mineral Policy Act, um, which is being given, it's one of the, the first bills that's being given serious consideration uh, for, for a very long time, and it doesn't address the very specific questions that, that are being asked here, but it does talk about the red tape and the, and the bureaucracy and so on uh, associated with federal lands and doing things um, uh, on, on BLM land and so on. So there is definitely a, um, there is some momentum going. Certain senators are more educated than others, their staffs are more educated than others, and so part of it is finding who those people are, and it, it is surprising sometimes how much traction you, you can get uh, with a well-presented argument. Typically though, you get about eight to nine minutes to, uh, to present something directly to, to these folks, and you better be succinct and, and, and really hit home, and of course it helps to work with other groups that uh, have mutual interests, and I think that's part of it as well, is connecting with uh, like-minded uh, entities that have similar concerns that, that you folks have here. But, uh, we, I think we are moving in the right direction, and if there is a change of control uh, in November, then it's likely that, for example, Lisa Mikowski will become the, the chair of that committee. Um, she's very much minimal policy orientated, so uh, we might see some traction on, on some changes. Keep your fingers crossed. Oh, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd kind of like to echo some of those comments. I mean, some of the feeling I detect is that to do these type, type of operations, it's almost impossible. And yet, I want to give a couple of examples, recent examples of, of success uh, in terms of the uh, minerals and minerals and energy industry. One would be, and these are, these are Coos County, one would be uh, Oregon Resources mining of, uh, of uh, black sands on county and Coos County lands in, uh, in Coos County by a company called Oregon Resources Company. The entire operation was was permitted, and uh, a mill was built, and uh, the project went underway. Actually, the project actually started in, in about 1990, and uh, a couple of years ago, it actually went into operation. Now, the economics of this of the operation changed, and so the project's been mothballed. Although they still keep the lights on at the mill uh, in uh, Coos Bay, but that notwithstanding. All the regulatory hurdles for the operation were overcome. The process went into operation. 70 or 80 people were actually hired and uh, went to work. Uh, the ground was, was open. This was open pit mining, okay? And, and metals. And it's interesting that a lot of times we look at in terms of if you have a mining operation, it's somehow a bad deal, and yet there's, if it's a sand and gravel operation, which, where, which is most of the mining in Oregon, which is huge in, in Oregon, that's really a problem. But metal mining, <coughs> that notwithstanding, the Oregon Resources operation actually went into operation and trucks all the Oregon was processed. Now the second example, you probably heard of it, okay, and against a, a, just a maelstrom of environmental opposition, Jordan Cove, LNG, there's an LNG terminal going in Coos Bay, it's a done deal now, okay, and uh, it's the biggest commercial project in Oregon ever, seven billion dollars worth. There were hurdles to get LNG, it happened, but it happened. So to think that in Oregon, that we can't do things that bring in energy and minerals, I, don't, I just don't go with that. It can be done. It has been done. Thank you. Next question. Why can't the county offer a well-designed exploration contract with protection for the county from reclamation liability, so potential miners could prospect, sample, and explore the feasibility of various county-owned sites. That was very well worded, because that's exactly what we would like to see the county do. Uh, we would like to see the county 
uh, partner with the private sector to properly develop the resources it already owns and do so in a manner that can uh, make sure if, if, it, if it becomes a project uh, that, uh, that not only is it financially beneficial for the county, but, uh, but there are some protections in place that make sure the, uh, the reclamation efforts happen as well. And so I think uh, with uh, the county's legal counsel and the county commissioners and, and private industry can get together and, and do just that. I agree. I'd uh, like to comment too on that. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Oh, um, one thing, that's basically what I've been doing for 25 years. you got to have the right research and data to prove that there is a possibility of this, and that's what today is all about. Next question, how about the possibility of a mineral smelter in the four county area? A smelter for gold, and then I'm not sure what AG, HG, and all other precious and strategic metals. I don't think a smelter will ever be done. I don't think we have any in the United States. Um, maybe Garrett knows about that. I think our, uh, the, um, our SARCO, are they in Texas? Uh, you're talking about Tellurium or gold? Any kind of smelter operation. Uh, yeah, there are some, but I think probably the question relates to the viability of doing it on a, on a regional or, or four county basis. Right. They're, it, they're in, it indicates a bigger project uh, done by four different counties. And I'll weigh in from just from the investor perspective. We, we, don't, um, we don't have the sort of large scale deposits that would require a smelter. What we're, the, the processing, so when you take the ore out of the ground in some of the, these small, very high grade zones that we have here in, in our region, uh, it's a matter of, of, of crushing up the rock and, and run to, to an extent running it through some machinery without any use of chemicals or, or any, any sort of harmful effects that separate some of the materials that are valuable from the materials that are not so valuable. And then you end up with a product at the end that uh, you're, you're probably going to ship off somewhere else to get it processed. Now, is there an opportunity to build a, a local facility that would process that? Uh, prop, maybe, maybe not. but. Uh, you're probably going to process some of those byproducts. You're probably going to ship it off somewhere else to have it processed. But you pull out a lot of the really valuable material here without any, any sort of uh, smelter operation that, uh, that, that would, would potentially be um, not something that, that certain members of our community would want in our community. But the smelter is a really large operation, and we, we don't need anything in that scale to, uh, to make a real impact in this industry here locally. So it's really, um, even, even on the processing end, once you're separating, you're trying to get the valuable materials out. Since what we're relying on uh, largely here in our community would be the gold content, um, you're, um, you, there are sometimes not even any sort of chemicals involved. It's just a matter of, of water and crushing rock, and it's, it's as simple as that in some cases. Frank? Yeah, <clears throat> just to answer that, <clears throat> there is a smelter in Oregon. It's a riddle. It's huge. Uh, a single vat, there's three of them, is about half the size of this room. And the triple, each, uh, they have triple electrodes, and each electrode is wider in diameter than a basketball. But, you know, that's, that smelter was set up to uh, basically melt dirt and extract nickel out, okay, from Nickel Mountain. So each project has its own needs, all right? So I'm saying we need a, a smelter. Well, there's, there's one. It's, it's mothballed, but it's still there. And, uh, and it has, uh, I think it may still even have the preferential pricing contracts with Bonneville Power. So, but as, as was mentioned in terms of these types of projects, you know, you customize your refining and, and your refining process to meet the size of the project. Right. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, just one quick note on that. It's, it's a very important point. I mean, any, any project um, that, that is developed has to have its own, I mean, we talked about a plan of operation, but there has to be uh, a method to uh, extract the economic value. And you may use similar techniques, similar processes, but it will be designed specifically for the needs of that particular uh, operation and particularly if there's more than one choice, two or three choices, you figure out you know which cost 
the least or uh, causes the least problems. So uh, there's some engineering that, that, that goes into that as well. All right, next question. We're getting right down toward the end here. Uh, why doesn't Michael assay a sample of the white metal, in quotes, what's thought to be tellurium, with the specto photometer that he purchased with the $25,000 of economic development money from Josephine County, or send a sample to a certified lab? That device uh, it has been used uh, for preliminary testing, unfortunately, uh, what what we need is to put it into a facility and to get a full scale laboratory going. But the, the reason why we're here is because of the fact that tellurium has been assayed from outside labs as we patiently wait to open up a, a lab here. And the, and the benefits of having a lab here locally is that it speeds up the process. And as you heard earlier, it, it takes a lot of money to do this industry when you're trying to get it up and about. So in 2010, the Board of County Commissioners, Dwight Ellis was the chair at that time, and Dave Toller and Sandy Castanelli, which is here somewhere, um, was gracious enough to believe in, in AMR to start that. Um, unfortunately, there was not enough revenues to actually open the doors to the lab, and there was not enough revenues under the economic development monies that the lottery provides for us to buy the third, per, uh, third piece of equipment. So I did have a, a, a person that was going to joint venture with me on that, Unfortunately, uh, he was killed in an accident. So that's kind of where we're at. We, we do have equipment, but, you, but this type of equipment is very technical. You gotta have, you gotta have someone who knows what they're doing behind it. And I don't know how to operate that particular piece of equipment. The person, the person that's willing to come here and to provide that service and to open up the lab, AMR, it still has that opportunity. He just retired. Over the years, I've had a small lab set up in Threats, Utah, and we have been conducting studies on our, our own money now for since 1997. But he's willing to come here and to set up a lab with us as he continues uh, into his retirement. And he's getting elderly, so our opportunities kind of slim these days, and that's part of this presentation was the criticalness of having the lab and putting this equipment inside and start using it on a daily basis. It's the same type of equipment that um, analyzes minerals like in water, but in this case, it's a whole different process with this equipment, so that's pretty much it. So yeah, the county, the county um, has already recognized that this is important, uh, important industry, an important thing that we need in our community, and has granted, uh, 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 granted Michael a small piece of equipment that's going to be help in, in studying what we have. Uh, but we have sent plenty of, and I should say Michael has sent out plenty of, of uh, samples that we are, we already know the delirium is here. It's not a matter of not knowing whether it's delirium or not. We already know it's here. Uh, it's just a matter of we need to study and see how much of it is there, and can it be a economic viable uh, byproduct of gold production or a, a primary uh, primary material that we go after. Um, we uh, uh, we do need a local lab to study these things. So there's just wealth of mineral opportunities all over the place, and a local lab lab is going to help with that. And uh, and that that uh, piece of equipment that the county has invested in will be used um, sooner or later, probably sooner. My right, next question: Whether our county or federal lands will be re re required to have a surety bond. All right, let's try that again. Whether whether our county or federal lands will be required to have a surety bond, which closes the door to many small-time operators uh, for underground mining operation. It, that that remains to be seen. Uh, well, if we're gonna well, hopefully the county's gonna, gonna talk even more than they have been in the last year about what. Uh, what a lease on county-owned land looks like, uh, what a 
what a partnership with the private sector to develop these mineral lands looks like. I would, I would um, assume that they would take certain measures to make sure that, uh, that the county lands and the public interest are protected. I'm sure there would be a, uh, some sort of bond involved in that. All right, final two questions here. One is, will there ever be a prospecting class or school in Josephine County again? The dream and vision of, of AMR is education. And when I came across the, the story of uh, great Governor Charles Martin and what he did here on our fairgrounds, I have been several years uh, speaking on trying to reestablish a prospecting school. And we've done a business plan related to opening up the laboratory, which is phase one. And then phase two would be basically having a school to teach fire assay work and, and chemistry work pertaining to prospecting, which is a little more technical. But the third thing of, of the phase of, of the laboratory and the prospecting school would, would also be wrapped around creating a, a, a museum. And the vision is to have all these activities in one location. And then the last part of that prospecting school would be also having Dogami on the same premises and bring back the, the Department of Geology and Mineral Industry back to Grants Pass when it was closed down in 2009. I spent 18 years studying the files and under the microscope. And once again, that's when I met Frank Latke. He was my first mentor. So it's very important to have a school. And we're not talking about a college, we're talking about a school for the layman. So, so basically when these tourists come here, they're able to take a two-day class to get familiar with the rocks that are here as they take their rafting trips and their backpacking trips. And you teach them how to use a simple hand lens to look at the minerals in the rock. So it's just, a, it, it's just a little tiny loop. It's referred to as a loop. And when you take up the rock and you bring it to your eye, if it's got gold in it, you're going to see it. So the idea is to be able to, to create, uh, create a school to be able to do that function. And that's my dream, anyway, on that part. And um, uh, of course, Dogami is a, a state agency. And so uh, we, we hope that. Uh, any state representatives that get to vote on things like uh, appropriations to the Department of uh, Geology and Mineral Industries, that uh, that uh, they would see the importance of the of of this state agency in helping Southern Oregon and other places to uh, to make things happen, and the and the resources that they already have available then to the public that uh, that can help this industry. Thank you, Michael. Uh, on that note, um, we. We invited an individual for Dogami that uh, handles, the com he's a commodities expert for the Department of Geology. And uh, on his own dime, him and his wife came down here and I met him for the first time and he's here in the audience right now. So, you want to stand up, Clark? No. <laughs> so he Unfortunately, we weren't able to get anybody else, but uh, him and his wife was gracious enough to come down. Thank you. All right, our final question today, will we ever be able to take back federal lands like Utah recently did? I guess I'm, I might be a good one to uh, talk about that. I don't think Utah recently did. They have passed a flurry of bills that will allow them to join the federal government in this prospect of the transfer of public lands. And uh, I can only answer for a couple of uh, potential members of the legislature, and that is that uh, they're eating and drinking and uh, sleeping this idea right now. And uh, so I would expect that if it is absolutely possible to see something like that happen, the ball will begin to roll uh, before long here in Oregon. Anyone? Okay, well, I guess that is it. We've exhausted all of our questions today. Thank you for your uh, just hanging in here today. It's been a very instructive day. Jay, I think I might let you close off since this is officially a SOS function here today, and it's the Southern Oregon Mineral Summit.
Thanks, Carl. Uh, we, uh, securing our safety SOS has a long email list of people who are interested in following our efforts and all the different things we're working on doing to uh, help get Justman County back on its feet. And, and a lot of our efforts are starting to branch into other counties as well. So uh, if you have up on our email list and you're interested, uh, please sign the, the, the forms we have back here on the table in front of the door. And also Gareth here has a, uh, has a, a large email and, and a newsletter following as well, everybody from the federal, federal level on down. And if you're interested in, in following some of, the, some of the things that Gareth is doing um, in his professional capacity, he's got, you, can, you can give us your email and let us know that you, you want to be on his email as well and we'll forward that to him. But um, uh, please, uh, the, you know, the number one thing I always ask is get involved in, in a series of solutions. A lot of people are throwing rocks at the different ways that we have to get us back on our feet. It's it, the entire county, the entire community needs to get involved in, uh, and, and in a series of things that can help get us back on our feet. And get involved in the solution and don't be, don't be part of the problem. And, and if you'd like to follow the things that we're doing, we're meeting, we have been meeting on nearly a weekly basis and uh, we're, we have a lot of work ahead of us in the next few weeks, or in the next few years, regardless of, of the votes that are in front of us today. And, uh, and given that a vote, there is a vote in front of us, Make sure you vote before May 20th. Uh, we have some very important decisions in front of our community right now, and and, uh, and so please get involved in in, this, in, in the solution, and, uh, and and join, partner with SOS and join SOS and get involved in some of the many things that we're doing. You can you can visit us at securingoursafety.org for all the information on all the different things that that SOS is doing. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, and once again, thanks to our panelists today for all of your hard work.